I want to welcome you all to what I hope to be a brand new um, method or tool for you to use for self-calming. Um, I am a psychiatric mental health nurse, and I'm very proud to say that I have been a nurse for nearly over 40 years. And in my nursing career, I've been a psych mental health nurse, a clinical nurse specialist, and then the latter part of my career, a research scientist. Most of my research work has been done at the VA San Diego, and it's mostly been done on this method we call mantra repetitions. I've always been interested in spiritual well-being and spirituality, and as nurses, we are holistic. We are not afraid to address matters of spiritual well-being and spiritual health. So I've always had this interest. And so today I'm gonna to give you a tool that will help tap into your own inner spiritual resources. Uh, I call this a rapid calming tool, evidence-based because of our research. And it's to give you a way to be present and calm in the midst of chaos, in the midst of the storm. And the focus of this is to train attention to be able to harness and train your attention on one thing, which then can help garner energy. And most of what I will be saying today, you may or may not have already heard about, or maybe you use some other similar kind of technique. But if not, this is an opportunity to build the muscle of your mind and be able to calm yourself. So let me say a few things about spiritual resources. What do I mean by that? Well, this program is based on the belief that we are a mind, a body, and a spirit. And that within each of us, whether we're aware of it or not, we have inner spiritual resources. And I call those things like love and joy, the inner calm and peace, altruism, ability to be selfless, um, to be kind and compassionate. Those kinds of things are our inner spiritual resources. However, when we are blasted with something like COVID-19 or even just the daily stress of life, our minds get speeded up and our minds get so focused on other things that we're, in, we're not able to tap into those spiritual resources. So training attention is key. Training attention and focusing on one thing and pushing away all the other distractions can help quiet the mind and if our mind is okay, if my mind is okay, then I'm okay. It's a great quote by Emma Seppala. This is sort of how our minds are. I love this uh, cartoon because if you look at all these little words and phrases, they jump from one thing to another. Um, do I have a soul and do I have clean underwear? <laughs> I mean, we, our minds go from, one, from the benign to the ridiculous or sublime to the ridiculous. Scientists have estimated we have about 70,000 thoughts a day. 90% of those are repeated. We repeat the same thing. And many of them are negative thoughts. So let's just talk a minute about what's happening with COVID-19. Never before experienced, I don't think, certainly not in our lifetime and maybe in our entire time that we are dealing with a pandemic of this global nature. And I don't know about you, but I've been going to a lot of Zoom meetings. And when I'm done with a Zoom meeting, I'm exhausted. I think that Zoom meetings do exactly what we are told not to do, which is multitask. You know, looking at everybody on the screen and then navigating the chat box and then moving from this to that and trying to keep, I mean, just keeping the Zoom going is one thing, let alone what content there is to learn. We also have workplace, fear and anxiety, the fear of constantly wondering, am I gonna get infected? Have I washed my hands? Have I done all the things to keep myself safe? And then there's grief and loss. And I was talking the other day um, to Carol about how we're having all these little losses throughout the day, the loss of our usual routine, the loss of our friends and seeing them, the loss of having a hug, or being close to people, all of those little griefs and losses add up. And we may not even be aware that our feelings of depression 
or fatigue are related to some of those losses. There's also the boredom for some of us of being quarantined. So think about it. The definition of boredom is wishing you were someplace else. That whenever we are bored to death, I mean, think about the times you're sitting through um, a, a lecture and it's, you're not interested in it and you just wish you could be someplace else. Or when you're on a bus and you're going on a long trip and you just wanna get there so badly. It's because you're not in the moment. So when we're bored, we're all sitting here wishing this pandemic were over and we could be at the beach. Financial worries every day on the news, you hear about the stock market, you hear about the business packages for small businesses and so forth. All of that is draining and triggers fear. And those of you that have children at home, I can't imagine. I have a nephew and he has four children, all younger than 10 years old. And they are all at home, sitting around the table. And he's walking around telling them to be quiet and quit poking each other and do that while he's also trying to do a full-time job. And then the uncertainty, when is this gonna be over? When is this gonna be over? So even just talking about these stressors, we're triggering all these different thoughts whirling around our heads. And these thoughts, whatever we think, then triggers physiological responses as well. And right now, guess what? There's no time to take an eight week mindfulness meditation or eight week yoga class. I mean, we can't even go out to do yoga, but there's no time right now to learn another stress management technique. So that's where mantra repetition comes in. However, there are other ways to reduce stress and focus attention. And I wanna mention just a few of these. Uh, first of all, breathing. I mean, right now, just take a deep breath and let it out and just relax. And that is another way to focus attention. Secondly, you can identify feelings, identify the things that your emotions are doing. You can say, yeah, this is stress, okay? I'm feeling it, I'm gonna label it and then let it go. Another thing we focus on is our bodies, our physical, my shoulders are tight, or in mindfulness strategies, they talk about being mindful, mindful walking, you know, mindful movement, those kinds of things. That's another way to focus. Identifying irrational thoughts and irrational thinking, cognitive behavioral strategies. All of these strategies work. All of them work once we do them. But I'm gonna introduce you to mantram. What is a mantram? And notice I'm saying mantram with the M and not mantra to make a distinction about spirituality. So a mantra is a prayer word. So this is, this is a list of mantras to choose from. And I wanna mention that these are all based on what we call wisdom traditions. These are words and phrases that have been handed down for centuries. These are words or phrases that people, mystics and wise men and women have been repeating and somewhat we think of giving them a divine charge, that these words or phrases are powerful. And some examples come from Buddhism, Om Mani Padmi Hum, Namu Butseya, those are both from Buddhism. My God and My All was from St. Francis of Assisi. Maranatha, which means Lord of the Heart. Uh, Kyrie Eleison, Christi Eleison, and uh, Rama, which was Mahatma Gandhi's, um, Eternal joy within is what that means. So these are just examples. This is not an all comprehensive list by any means, but these are ones that are recommended because they like pass the test of time. I call it, they met the good housekeeping seal of approval. So mantram, we use this word mantram. So why mantram and not mantra? Well, one reason is because mantra has been secularized. Everywhere you go, such as in this slide, it says 12 mantras to lift you up. And things like wag more and bark less, or it's not just a bad day, not a bad life. I mean, you can walk around and repeat that if you like. Um, I don't know that you'll get a whole lot of benefit. And the thing about a mantra, it's not a slogan, not a motto, not an affirmation. 
Now, many of you may already know about positive affirmations, such as I am lovable and capable, or I can do this, I am doing this well. Those are examples of affirmations, which are certainly powerful, and they can help a person in refocusing attention, but they don't have that spiritual charge. We talk to ourselves, self-talk, and sometimes people want to pick a poem or a song or something like that. That's not really what a mantra is all about. So why spiritual? Why are we saying that this has to be a spiritual word or phrase? Well, you can argue we are what we think. Think about whenever you fill your mind, whatever thoughts you're filling your mind, it gets bigger. What we focus upon gets bigger. I like to think of it as a balloon. You know, you have a balloon and you start blowing air in it and the more you focus, the bigger, the bigger the balloon gets. If you withdraw your attention or withdraw that air, it's gonna collapse. So being able to focus attention on what it is we want to focus in that moment is really important. There's also Hebe's law, if you haven't heard about it, it's when neurons fire together, they wire together. So that's where repetition comes in. It's like, how do we build habits? We build habits by repetition. And the more we repeat something in our brain, the more the neurons will wire together. The other thing about mantras and spiritual words is we believe that they have an effect upon us. So it's not like you have to go around and think Rama, Rama, peace, peace. I wanna feel peaceful, Rama, peace, peace. It's not like that. By merely repeating the word Rama, Rama with as much concentration as you can, you will experience over time that it will have a calming effect. And you can't take my word for it, you have to try it for yourselves. And lastly, there's been many research studies that have found that spiritual words carry more clout, so to speak, or have a greater benefit than do secular words. So mantram repetition program is what we've studied for the past, say, 20 years. And these are based on meditation tools. And they really include these three tools, repeating a mantram, and which when you do that, you're immediately slowing down your thinking. And in order to do it correctly, you have to be one-pointed and mindful and one-pointed attention. So these are three tools that work synergistically. Is this how you're feeling lately? That we just have too much to do? Even before the COVID-19, most of us living in this day and age feel that we have way too much to do and really not enough time to do it. And a lot of that is based on our technology. Uh, people, back in the 50s, people thought, oh, we've got washing machines now and we've got you know, these different time-saving devices and everybody thought we were all gonna be on vacation. But instead, we just fill it up. For some reason, human beings, we just are human doings rather than human beings and we keep doing more and more with less and less time. Time pressure creates what some people have coined as hurry sickness. When we are always in a hurry, there's this sense of being threatened. It's like the fight or flight, and it triggers the stress response. And this stress response then creates this kind of low grade pervasive anxiety. And I like the term infobesity. We have so much information. We have information overload. It's like we're all need to go on a diet from all the information that we have around us. And we're constantly interrupted and we often have the inability to finish one task at a time. All of these things lead to poor self-care. And that's where a mantra comes in. Merely repeating Rama Rama or Om Mani Padme Hum or whatever word you choose, by repeating that and refocusing attention, it gives you an automatic pause. It interrupts all those thoughts in that cartoon head you repeat your mantra and it gives you a focus and it wipes out all of that chatter. 
So by simply repeating a mantra, it takes you from automatic pilot into the present moment. It moves you from feeling like you're in a hurry to being more deliberate and intentional. It takes away a little tiny bit of time pressure, helps you to be calm and one pointed and live in the present rather than the past or the future. Here's a great quote, Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there is a tiny little space. And it's in that space that gives us the power to choose. When we are so in a hurry, we're not really in control. We're just putting out fires one after another, one after another. If we can calm the mind by repeating your mantra, there's a tiny little space there that allows us to kind of step back take a pause and make a decision how we want to move forward. Now, when I started this work, I actually met Eknath Eshwaran. He's a spiritual teacher from the Blue Mountain Center. I met him 40, 30, 40 years ago. And he had this eight point spiritual program. And I got into that and I was using his tools and so forth. And over time I could see what a benefit it was. And we originally taught it to people with HIV and AIDS back in the day when we had nothing else. There were no treatments. And then I realized that people had a hard time sitting quietly and meditating for 20 minutes every day. I'm sure many of you have tried different types of meditation and being quiet. And most of us can't sit still. That's why I like Mantram is that you can use it when you're not sitting still. You can use it on the run. So at the VA, I had the opportunity to do a postdoc fellowship and began this program of research and now have built 18 years of research. And we've done a number of different studies in different groups, patients with HIV and AIDS, veterans with post-traumatic stress and other chronic illnesses. We found that Montrem has benefited them. Healthcare workers, we've done several studies in the VA teaching Montrem to healthcare workers and even Korean nurse managers. I mean, this was amazing. One day I found this article and they had used mantra repetition teaching Korean nurse managers how to manage stress, burnout, and improve spiritual well being. And we've done some other studies. Our own Dr. Mary Barger and Dr. Um, Sally Hardin uh, worked together on a homeless women study. We taught homeless women in San Diego how to use a mantra to help them with insomnia. We've taught mantra to family caregivers of patients with dementia, nursing students, and community dwelling elderly for insomnia. So there's a number of different studies, both qualitative and quantitative, to demonstrate that this program works. And the overwhelming response of any of these participants is that when I repeat my mantra, it calms me down. It calms me down. That is the overriding common denominator uh, and it happens in an instant, in that moment that you refocus attention. So how do you choose a mantra? We recommend a traditional mantra. As I said before, words that are handed down and been used over the years. And sometimes, sometimes it's best to choose something unfamiliar. Now, those of you with a faith background, uh, you may choose a mantra from your particular faith or religious background, and that's fine. But sometimes it's better to choose one that has no um, definition in English. And that's why we recommend Rama, Rama. Most of us don't even know what that means, right? Or Om Nama Shivaya. That's another example. And those words don't necessarily have a meaning in English, so that when you're repeating those words and phrases, uh, you're not being distracted by the definition. We recommend don't make up your own. Again, for the same reason that it's not a motto, it's not a slogan, it's not self-talk. These are words derived from wisdom. And then at first, when you go to pick one out, you might wanna try one, repeat one for a little while and try it out and see what it sounds like. You may not notice anything, that's fine. Initially, you won't notice anything. You know, it's not gonna like, have a huge thunderbolt and you're going to be immediately transcending everything. That's not how this really works. But take your time when you choose a mantra. And then once you pick it and you decide this is my mantra, you stick with it for the rest of your life. 
Eshwarn even talks about using mantram at the time of death. And now with this pandemic, if we had the opportunity and could teach these patients that are on respirators, if they had a mantra, if they had a word or phrase that they could repeat while they're having all this other physical stuff going on, that could help calm them and would be a good strategy if we could teach them how to choose a mantra and use a mantra in that situation. You can let a mantra choose you. My friend Jim, he chose a mantra. He was very kind of allergic to religious backgrounds and so forth. So he chose Om Mani Padme Hum that he felt was neutral. And then after a little while, he thought, you know, that's way too long for me. I don't, I don't want to do that such a long one. So he tried to switch. He tried to choose Rama Rama, Mahatma Gandhi's. And every time he went to repeat Rama, his mind went to Omani Padme Hum. He said it was nuts. It made him crazy. It's sort of like that mantra that he originally picked had chosen him. And I've heard that from other people where they've picked a mantra, but for some reason, some other mantra is coming up for them. It's coming out of them, if you will. And if you have difficulty and you can't decide, because some people just can't decide, we just say go with Rama or even the word one, which is what Herbert Benson, who coined the relaxation response, he recommended in his early research was done with the word one. You need not identify spiritual or religious, however, um, you can, you can believe in, uh, not believe in God per se, but you may believe in mother nature or believe even in yourself. You don't have to be religious or spiritual to have an effect. And you don't have to think about the meaning of the word to have an effect. So how do you use it? When you use a mantra, you're repeating it silently, although it's okay to say it out loud if you want, or some people will sing it or chant it, that's okay. But Ashburn says you really get the most power by repeating it silently in your mind as often as possible. You can repeat it fast or slowly, doesn't matter, and ignore the other thoughts that are gonna compete. And every time you repeat your mantra, other thoughts are gonna pop in and you bring your mind back. So it's that training attention that is key. And I'll give you an illustration. Let's say you decide today that you're going to repeat Rama, Rama, Rama. And as you pick up your computer and close it down and get ready to leave this little seminar, you might be repeating Rama, Rama. And before you know it, you something pops in your head. Oh, dear, I forgot. You know, I forgot my mask. And I'm leaving the house. Oh, I better get that. And then all of a sudden, oh, oh, I wonder what tomorrow's going to bring. You know, you're, you're living today, but you're already worried about tomorrow. I'm wondering what's going to happen. Am I going to have enough energy? Whatever. Your mind wanders. And at some point, you're going to recognize, oh, I thought I was saying my mantra, but I've got these other thoughts that are competing. And in that uh-oh moment, you are raising awareness of your thought process, which is very powerful. And in so doing, you can then make the decision to redirect attention back to the mantra. And that's the opportunity to train attention. And I think of that as lifting weights. You know, when you go to lift weights, you're building the muscle of your mind um, every time you bring it back. That's really where the key benefit comes, is bringing your mind back, focusing on that word or phrase, and allowing it to have an effect. So when do you use it? Use it when you need to, when you're speeded up, when you're feeling anxious, when you can't get to sleep, but then use it when you don't need to. It's really important to use it during all the other down times during the day. I like to think of a mantra. It should be your screensaver for the mind. When you leave your computer and the screensaver pops up, it's because you're not using the computer at that moment, right? So when you're not using your mind in thinking and planning and, you know, making decisions and so forth, when you're not using your mind for that and you're in transition, then give your mind a break. Repeat your mantra and just give it a little tiny chance to chill out. So use it when you need it. Use it when you don't. 
And to give you an illustration of how a, one of our veterans describes how he has used Mantram in his life, and this is a perfect example. So listen carefully. He will talk about how he chooses a mantra from his page, how he uses it when he's making coffee, when he's doing this, doing that. And he will also talk a little bit about one pointed attention in managing his symptoms. So let's take a look. This is Rudy. <laughs> I will tell you how I'm using the mantra, and it's really righteous. Uh, we learn many different techniques. The first one is just uh, identify something that feels right when you're looking at your page. And I picked Om Namah Shivaya, uh, which I didn't even know what it meant, but it loosely means uh, I am the universe, the universe is me. Um, love, compassion, these things is really powerful. Uh, I don't know, inspiring stuff. But I just like the way it sounded, and then I practice saying it quietly in my mind and I see like a teleprompter go do, 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 across as I'm lighting up Om Namah Shivaya in my head. I just practice it, practice it, practice it in dead space and in times of stress. And uh, I use it, uh, I always use it when I'm putting on my shoes because I put on my shoes every day, even though I don't want to. I like being barefoot, but still I got to put on my shoes. Put on my shoes every day, I use it then. Uh, take a shower, not every day, because I'm still like a Marine, I'm still a little crazy, you know what I mean? I just do a washcloth sometimes. But when I take a shower, that's a lot of dead space of water hitting my head and neck, and I just say it then. Um, when I brush my teeth, I say it then. I make coffee every day, so I say it then. And every night that I sleep, I say it. Um, then I started using it for my driving, and, um, and any time I was under stress, because I had a, a girlfriend, and holy moly, nothing makes you more stressed than that sometimes. But it helped me. I used to blow my top. Now I don't blow my top. I also used to get really, really down. Now I don't get really, really down. And I used to not sleep. Now I sleep every night. I've never slept better. I got used to sleeping two or three hours every 24 hours for a long time, for 15 years. Something happened to the audio. I don't hear it anymore. That's not what it does. What it does is it lets me feel that it's okay to sit with it and walk with it and not have to drink or not have to use drugs or not have to uh, be stimulated because I'm down, but I actually feel it. And uh, that one pointed attention, um, it's paid dividends and other things in my life too, like paying my car tickets and uh, doing those little things, going to the bank, stuff that I really started getting an aversion to, like all these simple things, like being indoors gave me an aversion. Um, uh, being around too many people, an aversion. Well, the mantra helps me by saying it to my head, writing it in my hand with my finger, um, and then I do art therapy as well. I use my mantra as designs, and I just write it, write it, write it, and then in time, I become mindful of every stroke of every letter. So I'm having journeys with every letter, every stroke, every word, every phrase. And so I'm having almost like lifetimes happen in front of me. It just takes away all my stress. So that's how I use it. Let's see, let's go here. So you can see how Rudy really adapted this program. He adapted his mantra. He made it a part of his life. And the reason that this mantra was so effective for him is that he was able to call upon it. He was able to remember it in the times of stress. And he did that because he had, was using it all these other downtimes, during the shower, during his shoes, when he's walking, when he's doing this and doing that. So it's important to use it as much as you possibly can. I don't think you can ever use it too much. Use it when you don't need it, waiting in lines. I love using my mantra when I'm waiting in lines. I used to go to the grocery store and I'd pick out the shortest line. And sure enough, that was the line where they went to change the money and it took longer. And I used to get really agitated. And now I just think, you know, I'm not wasting time. I'm using mantra. I'm training my attention. I'm building resilience. 
it's like, this is cool. I mean, it, it, it slowed me down to not feel in such a rush. So when you're waiting in line, when you're at a stoplight, uh, when you're in traffic and you're waiting, 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 and oftentimes when we're waiting, what are we doing? We're wishing we were someplace else. We're anxious. We trigger our stress response. We do the fight or flight, and there's absolutely nothing we can do when we're stuck in traffic. So that's a perfect time to chill out, and repeat your mantra. Before sleep every night, we have shown in our research studies, and I wished early on that I had had an insomnia questionnaire for every single study, I found that Montrum helps people get to sleep at night, or if they wake up in the middle of the night and they have nightmares, helps them to fall back to sleep. So you use it when you do need it, when you catch yourself feeling stressed and upset, or you're obsessing and ruminating, but you can always use it when you don't need it. Now in the workplace, if you are a nurse or health care provider and you're in the workplace, um, you're going to be dealing with a lot of stress and it's important to stay present in the moment. And one really fast way to do that is before and after each patient. Before you go in and talk to your patient, just repeat your mantra a few times. Uh, use your mantra when you're doing that 20 second hand washing and instead of singing happy birthday or whatever they tell you to do, use your mantra. That's a good time to tell yourself I'm practicing attention, I'm calming down and I'm staying in the moment. Before donning or doffing personal protective equipment. Again, it's a way to just, just say your mantra a few times, Rama Rama, and then you know, think about, you're going to need your mind to remember the steps, but in between that use your mantra to calm down walking down the hallway or before any procedure you know before having to concentrate is when it's good to use your mantra so some of you might say well okay i'm going to try this but how soon will i get an effect will it work for me immediately and i can't say that it will it's going to take you some time like anything worth doing it takes time and practice but i've noticed over the years i've taught this program there's three stages and the first stage is just mechanical. Just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. You may not notice anything, but what's happening is a mind-body connection. When you repeat that mantra during those waiting times and during those, those slow periods, you're building a mind-body connection with the stress response. You're connecting mantra with relaxation. And that's really important. And then one day, all of a sudden, what you will have is an, what I call aha moment. It'll be a moment when you recognize, oh, I didn't get all upset about this particular thing. Or, oh, I noticed that I'm not reacting the way I typically do. And that is the fact that your mantra is working for you and you begin to have an experiential awareness. Oh, well, this is what that's like. Our goal ultimately is to create a habit. So just like Rudy repeated his mantra when he's making coffee, his making coffee could be a trigger for repeating mantra. I think in the hospital, and I would love to do a research study where we could teach healthcare providers to wash their hands and that every time they see a sink or every time they have an opportunity to use some gel or whatever, that they would use that as a trigger to repeat their mantra because in that split moment, they can relax. We want it to be habitual to make it a part of our lives, to make it automatic. So we're not having to think about it. So I'm gonna wrap up and I just wanna say that what makes mantra repetition so well suited for our day and age is that it's something you can do and it's invisible. No one knows you're doing it. It's inexpensive. I'm giving it to you today for free and you can go to any of Ashwin's books and you can read about it, you can learn about it, you can do it yourself. It's immediately available. So it's not like, okay, I need to relax, so I need to go get my yoga mat and I need to go to a room and I need to hook up to this or that. It's like completely portable. I even really did not want to hook Mantra to a phone app because I want it to be in your head and be available without having to run to your phone or, or turn on something. So it can be used anytime, any place even during some other activities. Uh, it's complimentary, it's non-pharmacological, simple to learn and non-toxic. There are no known side effects. So you have to try it for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. 
Give yourself a week. Make it a habit every single day. Use your mantra. And if you want more information, here's a couple of examples of some books you can get to read. There's my website. Um, Blue Mountain Center of Meditation is bmcm.org. And Ash Warren has a digital library of different um, tools and things. These are some books I recommend. You'll see the Mantram Handbook is the second one on the slide. And that is everything you ever wanted to know about Mantram repetition, according to Eknath Ash Warren. Also, Strength in the Storm is another um, book that we recommend. And then finally, again, you can find resources on my website. And I want to leave with you this final quote. And it's from a spiritual um monk or mystic and he talks about fasten this word to your heart so that it never leaves you come what may this word is your shield and your spear <laughs>